What happens when you purify your body, your mind, your spirit? Something miraculous. The body begins to heal itself. Welcome to the Medicine Girl Podcast, where each week we explore new ways to heal your body from the root, igniting your inner healer. You are a medicine. And now, here's your host, Robin Stebbins. Okay, thank you for that introduction. I am here with Rachel Maurice, a good doctor, we will say. Um, we're going to get into that, but Rachel, if you could just introduce yourself to the audience, sort of um, some wonderful things about you and sort of your journey to how you got here, and and then we'll just dive right into it. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, first of all, for having me. Uh, I appreciate um, being able to share and talk with people who are open as well and liking to listen, so... So my background is I am a traditionally trained medical doctor. I grew up in a household that was very heavily geared towards academia. My father was a physician and my mom was a lawyer. And my sister, who was older, was also, um, she was about five years older. So she kind of set the the stage for me in terms of going, continuing on into education, into post-secondary education. And interestingly, I honestly, when I was growing up, um, the sciences just came a little easier to me. And I'm not sure whether that in school, which I understand is a little different from what I thought it was, <laughs> um, you know, the, the arts and that creative side was marked so subjectively that I felt that I just didn't have the creativity and the ability to excel in that area. So I just tended towards the sciences. And so I ended up in at McGill University getting a bachelor's degree, uh, also interestingly, in microbiology and immunology. So I have a little bit more understanding than the average physician on microbiology and immunology and what I thought was virology. And so after that, I ended up going into medical school. I knew I wanted to work with people. I didn't want to do bench uh, sciences. I wanted to actually work with people and, and be a clinician. And so I went through medical school at the University of British Columbia. And then all of this, all of the while going straight through schooling, I did want to take some time off, but I was actually encouraged by my father not to, uh, saying that it would be difficult to actually get into these programs. So I should apply just in case I got the time off. But I did have the forethought to make sure when I was younger, didn't have any responsibilities to take the time even though I was getting myself into debt to travel and to have the experiences when I didn't have children and a lot of things tying me down. So I did make sure that I did that. Um, but then, so then I ended up choosing anesthesia as a residency program. And again, I did that with some thought with the idea and the intent behind that being, I knew that I wanted to have a family and I wanted to be able to raise my children and not work you know, 100 hour work weeks and have a nanny, um, which I've had, you know, I've heard some story, just horrific stories about that. And to me, I didn't understand why anyone would want to have children if you just pass them over to someone else to raise them. So finished my anesthesia residency and then got then found found uh, someone I thought was the love of my life. We got married had two kids and unfortunately divorced, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. I see this sort of as a blessing now with everything that I've learned and experienced. Um, but yeah, my kids were still young when we divorced. And unfortunately, it was a very acrimonious divorce and spanned a lot of years. The process was very traumatizing, I would say. I'm not sure that I would have understood that before, but I know now that it uh, was very traumatizing and we're still we've gone through periods of being on okay terms and not so much and um anyways in the midst of that i really drove myself into the ground from mm -hmm. a health standpoint and prior to that ever since i can remember actually as a teenager for me health was a priority or what i understood to be health which in the mainstream is really looking at your diet and exercise so that's kind of where my focus was for most of my time 
despite the fact that there's no uh, emphasis on that in traditional medicine, no nutrition, literally to this day, at least in Canada. So I'm Canadian. I forgot to say that. Yeah. Uh, it's the Canadian system. Like I, I know that there are differences in different countries. I think it's two, it's two hours though in the United States. <laughs> yeah. they, they get two hours of nutrition or um, counseling in how to talk about food and nutrition. Right. But not the importance of it. Yeah. No. No, and I say even to this day here in Canada, because I just, I haven't been in the operating room working now for over two years because of the mandates. But prior to that, um, the place I'm in is a teaching hospital still. So we get medical students and residents coming through. And I remember because of the, just the timing of where my mind started to open up a bit, I was asking a lot of questions of the students that were working with me or that were assisting the surgeons, you know, what type of nutrition if, if any education that they get. And they didn't even understand that it, I, what I was talking about was the food that you put in your mouth, as opposed to the intravenous, the fluids that go in when someone can't take any food by mouth. So, oh. yeah. That's um, indoctrination. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's so much that I see now that I still, I'm obviously still learning that I didn't even see when I first left. Um, but we can talk about that after. But so I, I yeah, I, going through that divorce, I got to a really, really uh, toxic emotional place. Like I'd given myself an ulcer, thought I was having a heart attack. And this was in my early 30s. And it sort of ties into the fact that when you are so highly stressed and so overrun with toxins, like literally this, my I, I've told my kids this, and it's kind of a joke in our house now, but there was a period of a year where after um, their dad and I split up that I, I couldn't eat anything. And the only thing that um, would, would stay down really was a Dairy Queen blizzard. So I was eating Dairy Queen blizzards for like almost a year. And I'm, you know, I couldn't think, I couldn't think properly. I had the classic symptoms of reflux, like classic textbook, and I couldn't even recognize them. Wow. That's, how, that's how kind of um, overloaded and how, how offline my brain was. So anyways, in this, in this, the, the worst time that it got to, I think it was um, 2018. So 2017, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and that's when I started delving into nutrition. And at the time coming across a lot of alternative physicians talking about veganism Hmm. So at that point, we both went vegan. I so I was trying to help her, and it started out as from a health standpoint, and then you know the the again this climate uh, agenda and the the animals. Of course, I still you know I still have reverence for, but you know I I, I didn't see what was going on at the time. So. I was vegan for about five years, but that was 2017. And then 2018, I happened upon Joe Dispenza because of just the timing of where things were in my life. And again, at that point, we were actually back in court. I was my own representative because I didn't have the money, didn't want to borrow the money to give to lawyers who didn't really actually do anything for me. Um, so Joe Dispenza really... Uh, changed the trajectory of my life. And I kind of dove into everything. I read every single book. I listened to every possible thing I could of his on um, YouTube and bought his courses. And then I was like, I got to go to a workshop. So I ended up, uh, the universe opened up for me and I ended up in Portland in 2019 um, at one of his week-long workshops. And something happened to me there that really solidified um, my, I guess the, the, the idea that things are not what we think they are and think this world, this 3d materialistic world is so limiting and it's limited by our senses and, and, you know, we are human. So, um, we are, we do have limited senses or so we're told, and, you know, we, I, I know that now it's just sort of all in the, in the evolution, but, yeah, the experience I had there was quite 
remarkable. I don't know if I, if you want me to share, I'd love sure, to share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, because prior to that, I was really very focused on um, what I could see, what I could hear, what I could understand, what was tangible, what was evidence before me. I couldn't, I wasn't the type of person that had, that was able to take a leap of faith, like, for example, say with religion. And that's sort of another thing that maybe ties into this as well, this everything going on in the world. But I was raised Jewish, but I had this resistance, this real resistance to religion and dogma, because I, I was always asking why. And it was like, I was a thorn in, in the side of my dad, because he, he gets so frustrated, because I knew that he couldn't really answer my questions. And it would just get annoying that I would ask why all the time. And I didn't want to just follow all these rules, you know, without even understanding. And I, and I learned Hebrew, but I had no clue what I was saying. It was all for, you know, prayer and um, being able to write. But, but anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely want to come back to this. So yeah. I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm already on my second page of notes. So keep going. <laughs> okay. Um. So... Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm the type of person that, that needed this proof to be able to believe things. And so I went, so I went to this event and it was the first day I went alone. I didn't know anybody. And I, at one of the breaks in the morning, uh, I went to go walk by the river because I just like to be outside, especially because most of the event was taking place inside. So I met this guy uh, at the light at the crosswalk and we just introduced ourselves and we started walking and talking and he was a little bit younger so I'm I'm 50 well I was 47 at the time he was 42 and um he was telling me why he was there when we talked about where he was from where I was from and so on and then he told me he was there because he had a rare type of cancer and I don't like to you know dig into people's histories I just let them tell me what they want and you know it's not my place to to that's my opinion. It's not my place to kind of push or anything. So he told me it was a neurological type of cancer and he had been on all these experimental treatments because it was rare and nobody knew what to do. And so there was just a bunch of chemo and stuff. And so he was, this was in California and we didn't really get into it. We talked about a whole bunch of other things and exchanged numbers. Um, so we really felt like we had a connection and we went back to the event and his group because there were there were a thousand people at this this particular event his group went off to do a challenge activity and my group stayed to do the meditation and we went into the next meditation and what happened with me about 20 minutes in was I started to get this squeezing sensation in the back of my neck like my lower cervical my upper thoracic vertebrae and um Dr. Joe Dispenza always talks about how when things come up in the body, people get scared and they often will, they end up changing their brainwave state, taking them out of the meditative state. And so he encourages people to just allow whatever to come up just to be. And so that was in my mind when I was feeling this and what was going through my head was like, I haven't injured myself. You know, there was nothing that I knew was going on, um, nothing from my history and just what something just popped into my head. I wonder if that's where this guy's cancer is. And, you know, I had no, no idea why that that thought even entered my head, but I just thought, okay, if that's, if that's the case, cause I'm at this event anyways, that, you know, all these weird things are happening. Um, I'll just hold them in my heart, send them love and so on. And so um, that, that went on till the end of the meditation, that feeling was still there. So I sent him a message. I said, Hey, come see me when you get back. I just have a story I want to ask you or a story that happened to me. And I want to ask you some questions. And he said, well, well, what's up? And I said, well, I don't think over text would be a great idea. I said, just come, you know, find me. And he said, well, I'm just on the bus on the way back. So I'm really not doing anything. So I said, okay. So I told him everything that happened and he didn't respond. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, um, he came over to me and he had tears in his eyes and he said, um, you don't understand. He said that, I just had radiation two or three weeks ago on my C4 to my T2. And so that alone was just both of us were like, oh my God, that's so weird. Like, what are the chances of that? Then the next day he woke up, he said he'd had pain. He'd been in chronic pain for, he didn't know how long. He woke up the next day, next day and his pain was gone. 
And, uh, you know, it was just, I always, I, I've always believed that things happen for a reason. Um, you don't always know in the moment. You might not ever know. You might know years down the road. Uh, but that was just something that, to me, I, along with everything else that I was witnessing at that event, because honestly, the, the things that, that, I, that, I, that I saw before my eyes, you know, I'd seen and I'd heard maybe on videos or interviews and so on, but it's still hard to wrap your head around. It still doesn't necessarily feel like it's tangible. But what I saw was it, literally it was miraculous. And the biggest thing for me was that Joe Dispenza at that time, and it was for me, everyone's different who they resonate with, but he really walked me through the science behind how, how all of this works. And that just was so eye-opening to me. It was just such a revelation and it actually made sense. And I also understood why that's not understood in modern medicine or m like modern mainstream science because it, it, because that is focused really on the physical world and it doesn't take into consideration you know quantum physics and all of this stuff that's really hard for most people to have any understanding i mean it it can be made it can be made it can be simplified to a degree it's, it's hard to understand still, but at the same time, it feels like it's kept under, it's kept under wraps, right? Well, yeah, it's kept under wraps because it's not profitable for the medical industrial complex if we can heal ourselves in a few minutes with the belief. Yeah, it's the, it comes down to belief. I mean, I've seen that even with matrix people that believe the radiation and chemo is going to cure their cancer and it does. Right. Like you can even sometimes sidestep toxic poisons that are going into your body because you have the belief that it's healing you. Right. Well, and that that was, you know, the stories that were brought up again in some of Joe Dispenza's books. Like it wasn't just him. Like he set me on the path. Um, you know, I'd read Bruce Lipton before, but Lynn McTaggart and Greg Braden and Rupert Sheldrake. And like, you know, there's just so many, Anita Morjani. The, the, the stories of sort of other cultures that we don't necessarily know about like indigenous people who drink strychnine but they 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 do it in this state where they know that it's not going to kill them right and it doesn't it does not kill them but the average person it would kill them mm -hmm. right so you that that's that's really strong a strong belief and a strong um you know it's it's in the body. It's not even. It's not just in the mind, right? I mean, it's all connected. It's but. all connected, and there's. And I truly believe that none of us have any idea, nor will we ever, how this synergy works. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is beyond our capability to understand it. But that the beautiful thing is that you don't have to. Right. You don't have to sit there like a junkyard dog chewing on a bone, you know, trying to get to the meat. Yeah. Just never yeah. finding it, another hamster wheel. Like it's just I I've taken it down to like some really basic principles. But we can we can talk about that um when you're done with your this am amazing story. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um so yeah, so this that opened my I started um with once I discovered this after I went to the workshop, I just started really connecting with people that um, were on the same frequency and and I was reading books so voraciously like I had not before like I I was interested in science through my schooling but not with the passion that I now or at the time kind of it, there was a revival of passion and I felt like I read the number of books I read in two years surpassed like the previous 30 years and I, I couldn't get it in fast enough and um, then I was trying to figure out a way to exit the system before COVID mm -hmm. because I knew that it, I was starting to feel out of alignment with what I was doing, you know, and I was talking like I'm a, I'm a talker in not necessarily in big public forums, <laughs> but, but in the operating room, like I like to talk with my colleagues and the nurses tended, they just tended to be more open-minded and 
wanting to listen and wanting to learn. So I was talking about everything I was learning and, and also how I was feeling out of alignment. And they were very supportive and very encouraging of saying like, you know, well, you're helping people within the system and you can change things within the system. And at the time, I guess part of me was like, okay, maybe that's, maybe that's my role. I see now that that's an impossibility. It's just, it's, it's not possible. But at the time, you know, I was comfortable financially, right? They set you up to be very right. comfortable. I wasn't working full time. I I had always, almost always been working part time because I wanted to have days home with my children because that's, you know, I wanted to be there for them. And that was the point for me of having kids. So I was comfortable, you know, I could do anesthesia like the back of my hand. Um, you know, it's still, it's, there was still a level of, of, stress basal level of stress because you're holding someone's life in your hands and interesting this came up in a conversation I was having recently with someone else about how a lot of people used to liken anesthesia to or being an anesthesiologist to being a pilot um, there's a lot to do on takeoff and landing and hopefully everything in the middle is smooth so there's not a lot to do when it's smooth obviously there are bumpy rides but with an anesthesiologist, you're not going down with the plane when the plane goes down like a pilot. But from what I have been learning over the last basically year and a half, a whole new paradigm of how the body works, um, working in the hospital, in that environment, under blue light, surrounded by all the EMFs, totally disrupted circadian rhythm for over 30 years, I was destroying myself. Like I was going down just at a slower pace. Mm hmm. So, um, yeah, that I so yeah, things were comfortable. And then then um, COVID hit. And um, I have to say, at the very beginning, I was scared, I still fully was fully on board with the virus um, ideology. And, you know, we had anesthesia within our hospital was made this special team that if anybody in the hospital needed intubating, it was anesthesia. We had a designated kind of um, call to do that. And so we had, again, we looked like we had hazmat suits on, you know, shields, and some people had like massive respirators and big head things. And um, I started to realize, like, we we didn't have a lot of people coming through that had COVID or that were, you know, needing something, needing ventilators. That's not even a thing what they were doing. That's, that's a side story too. But I started thinking that maybe our city just got lucky. Things passed over us <laughs> and because I mean, like all the videos, right. I mean, if, if nurses have time to make all these TikTok videos and, you know, their videos of empty wards and 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 really our operating room slowed down like we we had sort of a make work project for us we, lo, so many of us were sitting around in rooms doing like nothing yeah that's so, across the country all the everyone I've ever talked to that's worked in a hospital has said the same thing it's like well they assume their hospital was the one that yeah escaped but yeah and, and so I started phoning colleagues, like when you do medical school, you disperse across the country to do residency. And then when you do residency in one spot, you dis disperse across the country to get whatever job, take whatever job you have. So there were a lot of people that I knew across the country and some even in the US. So I started phoning them saying, what's going on in your hospital? Like, what's and, and like you said, it was the same thing. I mean, maybe little blips here and there, um, but really... But the blips were more um, the fake PCR tests. They were testing positive. So then they would take them up to a room, isolate them. Sometimes they would put a healthy person on a ventilator and this, you know, Fauci death protocol with the midazolam and the rendezivir and shut their kidneys down and fill them up with saline and have them deceased in six to seven days because of the protocol, not because of a, you know, yeah. virus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I started to see, like, I started to question things. Mm -hmm. And I, so I started doing more, I started doing some diggings, doing some research outside of what we're being told on mainstream media. I mean, I never, I didn't watch, didn't say never, but I started to reduce the amount of television that I was watching. So I didn't really watch a lot of TV. And what I, what I found was I came across Carrie Mullis talking about 
the PCR test. He was the inventor and, you know, the refrain has listened to the experts. So who better to listen to on the PCR test than the person who created the test? So I started realizing that uh, this PCR test was flawed for what we were using it for. Um, but there was a lot of, uh, a lot of stress and a lot of heightened anxiety in the operating room. Like when I'd be waiting, when we'd be waiting for a patient to wake up, the nurses would be, you know, so anxious. Oh my God, did you see the numbers? Did you see the numbers on the news and blah, blah, blah. And I'd, you know, start saying, okay, like, just hang on a sec. Do you know what those numbers mean? Do you know what the P PCR test means? So I'd ask questions. I wasn't telling them. Right. Ask questions so that they could come up with the answers and realizations on their own. But I started getting um, hauled into the chief of staff's office um, and for also for not wearing my mask properly because I hadn't I hadn't worn a mask for almost 15 years after I got pregnant in the operating room because the teachings that we learned were and the research showed that there was no increased risk of infection transmission, nothing unless you, the only reason you needed to wear a mask in the operating room is if you were around the sterile field. So any big particulate matter would not end up falling in to the. Right. Field. So take the sterile field now, like what, cause I do home health and yeah. we're doing sterile procedures in these filthy patients houses. So <laughs> tell me how sterile that is, but yeah, I think that's another. Yeah. Another avenue. <laughs> Another have. avenue of, to poison yeah. people with all the chemicals that they use to sterilize yeah. as opposed to just anyway, keeping it nice and clean and flush and right. Well, and the same goes with the the um like the alcohol, the what do you call it, the hand sanitizer. I mean, all over the hospital. And benzene in it and all sorts of chemicals that they you don't know, go and it goes directly in your bloodstream and yeah, I think it's the chemicals that are making people sick in the hospital causing the C diff. Um, of course, antibiotics kill everything. Um, and then you go home to your house and you eat your Roundup food. Roundup was first patented as a broad spectrum antibiotic. So, you know, it, we're just. It and a mineral, mineral chelator. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> it used to unclog drains. Wow. Well, and then it would, wouldn't it pull minerals from your bones and hair and teeth? into yeah into the bloodstream like vitamin d3 does that also yeah i've learned a lot about, about vitamin d3 from you <laughs> i'll stay away from that <laughs> i promise that's <laughs> my, my only mention of it <laughs> okay um yeah so so i started yeah I started getting sort of reprimanded for talking about things i was told not to talk about not to ask questions not to talk about anything like we had we would have honestly 10 to 15 different protocol changes in a day in the operating room. Like nobody knew what was going on, what we were supposed to do and everyone would just throw up their hands. And I mean, that's part of, you know, how you end up right. And that we learned from Jason from juice, juice Merlot, I think, or used Merlot, however you pronounce it, that psychiatrists, you get people confused, right. And then exactly. they're easier to, easier to control the easier to comply with, yeah. with what we want them to do. So the, there was talk about this and, or maybe I should use another term. I don't know if that is. A problem. Yeah. I have to delete it now. Cause I, I had a, a podcast deleted from 2019 that we were taught or 20. It was like maybe 2019 or the first part of 2020, yeah. but they went back and deleted it. Really? Because of the use of that word. We were talking about, talking about, this is, you know, right at the beginning with David Kahn, who's phenomenal. It was a great conversation. And we were really just saying, you know, either way, the body heals itself, you know, get rid of the toxins and the poisons. There's nothing to fear. And then we kind of talked about what the agenda was. So usually when we talk about the agenda, it's, I consider that to be a bullseye. Like, yep, we were right on target on what we had figured out. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, well, shots, I don't know. Is shots a safe? Shots is fine. Or jibby jab. I say the jab or just. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the, the idea of the, the jab was coming around and in my head, I had already, I think I had taken one flu shot 
and then came around to realize like with this, it was useless anyways. So I wasn't taking them. And I certainly was not going to take this because I realized it was an experimental thing that they were doing. So there was no way I was going to do that. But I thought we had a ton of time, right? Like, because it takes forever for those things to come to market. And then sure enough, you know, <laughs> it happens right away. And I thought, are you kidding me? And, you know, I had actually gone to my uh, chief, of, no, not chief staff, the head of the department and said, do we actually have to take this to continue working? And he said, well, not, not that I know of and not now. So that was fine. Um, until the, in Toronto, I think it was in Toronto in the spring of 2021, where they started influencing or they, the, what came out was they were, they were influencing obviously, but were recommending that children 12 plus go and get them and they didn't need parental consent and they right. didn't need to tell their parents and they could get it at school. They could get help and their parents would never even have to know. And that was that, <laughs> that was, that was the end of my rope because I thought who that, who the F do these people think right. that they are to go around, you know, and surprisingly I was bringing this up at work and a lot of my colleagues, like a lot of the other physicians, and I'm mostly around surgeons who tend to have a little bit bigger egos, but, um, and be more headstrong in particular, the women. Um, but they, they seemed very defensive about the rules. Yeah. But like, you'd be okay with this for your kids. Like I, 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 I didn't understand that. And Anyways, I just thought, well, okay, I'm not okay with that. And, you know, I went to the school, I went to the principal, I went to the vice principals. And I was like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in this, but my kids under no circumstances, you know, are you to do anything with my children without my knowledge or consent? Nothing really happened at that time, but that's when I really got up in arms because, you know, that's when the, the mama bear comes out kind of thing. And um, I thought I was good because my kids, I'm very open with them. I tell them, you know, I talk about everything that was going, they knew exactly where I stood. They knew that I was one of the rare people in the city that wasn't kind of going along with all of this stuff and didn't have the same viewpoints. And there were, it's a small, small enough city that I'm in that a lot of the physicians know each other. A lot of the kids play the same sports, you know, or in the same activities and all the other parents were giving their kids, you know, these jabs and my kids were still okay with not getting it because, their kid, their friends didn't care. I would say most of the, for, mo for the most part, their friends didn't care. Like I was hearing about in other places. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what ended up happening was in just before school started again, after the summer in 2021, my daughter dances a lot and her dance studio, I got an email a week before uh, they were returning to dance saying that all the kids had to get the, the shots. And um, in my head, there was no way, there was no way on earth that was happening. So I replied saying, you know, this is not, this is, this shouldn't happen. It didn't, it wasn't even required by our provincial health officer. Um, she had said K to 12 extracurriculars, they didn't require them. And so I don't, I'm not the type of person that, you know, walks up to people and says, Hey, you know, I'm a doctor. Like, that's just not me, but I was pulling that card out here to, tell the dance studio owner that I had a little more understanding than the average person. They weren't being told exactly what was going on in mainstream. And so I was sending her information, right. you know, even the fact that it was experimental, most people, you know, the nurses I worked with, some of them didn't even know for like well over a year. Some of them still don't know. I, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's mind boggling. So, um, you know, I had, I was trying to pull out everything possible because I said to my daughter, I said, you know, let's go to a different dance studio. No, all of her friends were there. So at this time she was 14, I think. And, you know, I'm not, my, their dad was not on the same page as me. And, you know, we split our time. So it's, it was a week with me, a week with him. And there's only so much you can control, but I literally tried everything possible and to the point of bribing, um, you know, because they were bribing, they were doing like lotteries, million dollar lotteries, yeah. tests, marijuana, even just junk food, right? Donuts and beer, yeah, McDonald's. And so, um, unfortunately, I lost that battle. And 
Uh, both my kids ended up getting it. Uh, I was devastated, like devastated. Um, to the point where I was in my head, you know, I'd gone out for dinner, I think, um, a couple of days after with my daughter. And I was thinking to myself, like, this could be the last time that I see her. That's where yeah. my thoughts were. And I was like, it was really hard. Actually, the, the emotions are coming out now, but it was really, it was really difficult. Um, and I think like I wallowed in that for about a week. And then I thought to myself, okay, you got to get a hold of yourself because this is not stopping. This is not the end. Like they're going to keep coming. So you need to, you know, get up and still keep them informed, do what you can to help them. Um, you know, I didn't want to share everything anymore because I also didn't want to get them scared or in the mindset that they, their thoughts might harm themselves. Right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's actually when I was approached by, you probably know Stephen Malthouse and, and Charles Hoff. I kind of was in, in that community. Um, when I started to see all this stuff happening, I, I um, ended up on an email list and on Zooms with the physicians that were right. seeing what was going on. And, and Charles phoned me up and said, Hey, you know, we're going, we're doing this um, doctors on tour to speak with people in the community directly person to person, not just on zooms, you know, can you come talk with us? And, you know, they, they lost Daniel Nagasi somewhere or whatever. And they're like, you know, it'd be nice to have a woman talking. And so honestly, at the, my initial response was I, Oh my God, I can't do that. Like I just, I can, first of all, I, I have a, I, I, I have been, I'm getting better because I'm pushing myself, but I was terrified of public speaking to begin with. Like right. never mind talking on the most controversial thing that's taking place in the world. So uh, my initial thought was, you know, I can't do that. Um, but I said, let me get back to you because he was asking for the next day. And, you know, I went into a meditation and I thought about it and I thought, okay, that obviously that initial reaction was coming from fear, like fear of a bunch of different things. And then I thought if I do go and speak, you know, my little kind of my microcosm of fear of public speaking is so minuscule and irrelevant compared to what is taking place and the impact that I can have, even if it's just to one person, right? So, you know, it was kind of, it was a no brainer that I was going to do it. And I just wanted to make sure it was okay with my kids because obviously there could be repercussions for them. And so I did, I went and spoke out. And of course the media got a hold of that because, you know, they had already done enough with Charles, I guess, and Stephen and, oh, here's a new face. Let's, you know, let's slander. Mm -hmm. And anyways, that, that was, so that was uh, Christmas time of 2021. Um, and oh yeah, I had earlier that year I had left work because the mandates came in, in October of 2021. So I didn't think that I thought, you know, the place was already the hospitals, the whole system was already a dumpster fire to begin with before COVID, you know, with understaffing and just the way things were run, like the public really has no idea what was going on beforehand because we, we weren't really allowed to say anything, right? Otherwise you'd you'd lose your license. Right. So I didn't think I was going to be gone for very long because I thought, well, it's not sustainable, right? They kick out, like it was like 2,500 people, healthcare staff, I think in British Columbia. And, you know, so I left and I just started doing a lot more research and getting myself a little bit healthier. And the more time that went on that I was not working the more I realized how toxic that environment was. Mm. I just did not know. It's like the fish swimming in dirty water. Like you just, you don't know until you start to clean up that water, how dirty that water was like from everything in yes. there, including all of the emotions, the hierarchy, this, the way people, I mean, the indoctrination, but just the way people treat each other, you know, yeah. staff to staff and patients and, you know, it was, it was, it just became clearer and clearer. And I started to have thoughts of, I don't even know if I could go back if I was asked back. Um, and I'm at the point now where the, I couldn't, I know that I absolutely know that I could not go back. And so many more things have come to light, even 
you know, I've come across, I went down a big rabbit hole and I, now I follow Dr. Jack Cruz. He's opened up my eyes to uh, this whole new para paradigm of how our body actually functions on a subatomic level. So that kind of the food, yes, there's a lot of things that matter, the food and the biochemistry, but that's almost, I mean, it is a downstream effect from upstream signals, which is, you know, like you talk about, like nature, light and water and magnetism and our mitochondria lie at the foundation of, you know, they produce all the energy for our body to do everything. So you need functional and, you know, well-working mitochondria to produce the energy to heal the body. So if your mitochondria aren't working properly, then you will start to break down. So that was, you know, Dr. Ju Dr. Jack Cruz kind of got me. Um, I started learning all that stuff through opening the door from him. Um, and now where was I going with this? Oh yeah. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't go back. And interestingly, he is working. I don't know if you um, listen to his or read his stuff at all. So he's opened up, he's a neurosurgeon. Do you know who he is? Or yeah, uh, yeah. I've, I've read. Okay. Well, um, for the listeners anyways, he's a, an, an American neurosurgeon who went down his own journey. And for the last 20 years has been trying to bring this information to light, but he's had um, like the CIA, the FBI um, come to his door to basically shut him up um, for quite some years. But yet, I mean, my, my feeling on that is, again, and, and this kind of goes back to my first question was how they groom the schools for people that are high IQ yeah. Which they, they call it intelligence quotient. I call it indoctrination quotient. Like they want to know who is the smartest, just smart enough to be able to regurgitate the information, memorize it, and put it back into the proper places yeah. that they want you to. Yeah. They're going to give you the status. They're going to give you the, the college education and the advanced degrees. And they're going to give you the status of you're smarter than, than everyone else. Right. And they control that sect with pieces of paper. Here's your peer-reviewed yeah. article from this prestigious university. And that's as good as gold for people. Right. I could pretty much tell you the moon is made out of blue cheese, you know, enough times with these studies. And it's like, okay, well, now it's fact. And get the media on board. And all of a sudden, it's just common knowledge. Um, so I question everything now. Yeah. I question the the way that they have told us our bodies operate, you know, with the mitochondria, you know, spinning out ATP like a factory. Um, we we see a lot of it is just uh, could be, you know, what the artifacts are on electron microscopy. Right, right. It could be the staining. It could be the fact that we're observing it, you know, when you get into quantum yeah. field. Am I just observing this because I think this is what I'm seeing? So this is actually changing what I'm seeing. So I take it back to they've corrupted everything. So, you know, the other thing I was going to talk about was you're, you're raised Jewish. There's a certain set of things just tick off the boxes for your salvation. Same with Christianity and a lot of the religions. You just have to do X, Y, Z, and you're saved. Right. It takes that fear out, but it also puts, takes the wisdom and the intuition and your connection to God from you. I think that's what they sever first. Yeah, I agree. Otherwise, I agree. they couldn't trick us into all of this stuff. Yeah. And they do it from the beginning, you know, right from the womb. Actually, I had um, Kristen Nagel on and we talked about how they get from the moment of conception. They're already starting to pull you into the matrix. The the mother with the, the her baby inside of her, you don't know if it's okay. You have to go to them, the medical industrial complex, to radiate the womb or, you know, the amniocentesis and pull out the fluids to tell you you're okay. Yeah. And that I think, just as a side note, I think of that as the biggest way they get us. Because even people that are awake 
go and give their blood to the medical industrial complex to tell me if I'm all right. Tell me if I'm healthy. It's they separated us from birth. I know if I'm healthy, I know if something's wrong. Yeah. It's not just this esoteric thing. My body will give me messages. And if you're really sensitive to it, you're not on alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, any of the matrix drugs, packaged foods, um, the music, I think, is one of the worst ones in movies because yeah. you don't even know you're being you're consuming toxins that way. Yeah. But um, just to say, okay, we don't know, but here's what we do know: sunlight charges my body. Yeah, sunlight charges my body when I'm not wearing like I don't wear anything on my skin; it's bare. I think that's why women especially start to look older because we're, they're always wearing makeup. Yes. Yeah. And makeup has God knows what chemicals on it. They're reacting to the UVA, UVB. It's radiating those chemicals on your skin uh, day in and day in and day in. <laughs> like yeah. I saw your, your um, it was like a video on sunscreen and just letting your body make its own, was it nitrogen? Mel- oh, oh, hydrogen. Hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah. Hydrogen. That was, that's incredible. And, and that's just the, the thing that we figured out. Right. Exactly. It's the synergy. Exactly. That's what we can't, you can't isolate mother nature and say, here's vitamin C, take a pill. It's the orange that got the sunlight and the moonlight and the bird sounds and the water coming up through it and the peel and the enzymes on the outside of the peel. Like that's the medicine. Well, and, and bringing back, I know you said you weren't going to talk about vitamin D anymore, but even vitamin D that you make from the sun, like there are from the sun hitting your skin, there are over 900 metabolites of vitamin D. And here we've made one in a pill form, right? So yeah, the, it, the average person doesn't know anything about that. And, and, and that's the 900 that we, we see, right? right. Yeah. And it's the 15 to 17 different reactions that I can see the, the hormones and the, and whatever is being created with that. But yet that's our studying mind. Our studying mind is never going to figure it out. But what, when we reduce it down to, okay, it's, staying in alignment with this my intuition the messages from my body the connection that i have to a creator to god whatever you want to call it that i think that is where we can then find our center again yeah and i appreciate like i've read you know especially after in 2019 I felt something was coming. So I just was, I got a ham radio and seeds and like, I didn't know what was, I was just nesting like I was pregnant or something. I just like, something is happening. I don't know what it is. And then when 2020 hit in March or April, I just was like, this isn't it. This is just the appetizer of what's really coming. And, um, and as we're progressing forward, it's like, oh, they, I think they want our souls. Yeah. They they want to take out the humanity out of all of it. That's why, you know, we have these chat AI things that will write everything for you and take pictures and make you look like you're in Hawaii or, you know, so it's, it's a slippery slope. And it's not, it, it's not even hidden that that's. No, that's- no, if they go on the, I, like, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. If that's what you, you know, want the definition it's go on world economic forums website. And they will tell you everything that they're doing. This, you know, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, this is, this is, look at what they're telling you. And that's their end goal, the transhuman agenda to merge humans with AI and to take the humanity out so that you're taking the, you don't have to control your slave population anymore with all these techniques. You have a computer that will control them. Yeah. And then then the question I always ask is, is like, but then what? Like, this is this, 
you know, they're, it's like they're consuming themselves. Right. This, and there is no head of the snake. So what I've concluded with, with all of this is that you just starve the snake. You starve it without paying attention to it. You don't give it the energy. And like you said, with your kids, like I, the, the whole divorce thing that you went through and the trauma with that. And I face that too. My, my son's dad is very asleep and very in that matrix mindset. And, but he didn't really want to raise my son. So here I am in California raising my son by myself and you know, even on the visits, I had to say absolutely no tests up the nose. Um, but to see, like, I think it's the same thing when you go back and you realize, you know, terrain theory and um, Louis Pasteur made up all that. So they have known that from the beginning. So what have they been putting in those little vials? Right. From the beginning. I don't think this is name maybe necessarily anything different. Yeah. Except for their mind controlling us to say mRNA experimental spike proteins is spinning this stuff out. So it gets in our head. I mean, I know clearly we had a lot of reactions with blood clotting and, and strokes and myocarditis and other medical issues that went up. But we are also more toxic as a population than we ever have been. Yes. And they're spraying more things in the skies, or they call it cloud seeding, just go on geoengineering to see what that is. But that is affecting the soil too. Because here, I watered my soil and it's like it has silicone sprayed on it. It won't go underneath the oh. soil. It goes oh. in about an inch no longer how i mean doesn't matter how long i'm spraying the water but you know we're adaptable too you look at all of the toxins and the poisons like i have patients that are 200 pounds overweight and eat nothing but packaged foods like ho-hos and ding-dongs and donuts and gatorade in the bottle like they don't drink water and if they do it might be a little sip of tap water to take their medications and they're still making it, right? They're still living year after year after year after year. Not healthy, but that's the question. And the reason I started the podcast was in 2019 was what are we capable of if we're not toxified or poisoned in any way? And that experience that you had with Joe Dispenza at the workshop with that young man is what we're capable of. That resonance that we have when we're in alignment with this our own soul, our own connection to God, not what the false gods are programming us for. Yeah. And what's interesting is um, what I noticed what was very noticeable to me was people, a good portion of the people who kind of saw this from the get go were Christian in faith. Now I know there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of dogma and there's a lot of variation when it comes to people who are, you know, religious and Catholic and so on and where that, that whole, you know, history comes from, but still this idea of believing in God, believing there's a higher power, there's a belief and a faith and they, you know, they saw it right. It's saw right through it from the beginning. Well, I don't know that most of them did. Um, if you look at percentages, the flat earth communities, 99% did not get the shot. Um, when you look at the churches, the churches were promoting it. They were promoting them right. to get it. They couldn't come to service unless you had all four. They, you couldn't, you know, unless you're wearing the face diapers or had, you know, your test in hand or your your card. So I think it's, it's those that, um, and I, I think Jason talks about this too, you, you know, with you being Jewish and I was raised um, Methodist, it's these rituals that you do, you're supposed to do what you're told. Right. You're obedient to authority. Right. But the ones that have that, I, that connection to God, 
the real connection to God. They don't need a translator. I think those, you're right, absolutely weren't falling for it. And that's how I, um, my younger brother and sister haven't talked to me since 2020, but my older brother is a Christian. And I said, the way I, I got through to him was, do you think God made a mistake? Right. And then that was it. He just sort of was, didn't, hadn't really thought about it before. Right. And, and I really liked what you said earlier. Your brain was offline. It's like our brains go offline when we're, when we're in that sort of matrix mindset. I was there, you know, when I had my son and, and, but it's just, that's what started really waking me up, T turned off my TV, got rid of it when he was born 17 years ago and just started really focusing on nutrition. And, and then you start realizing like all of the ways they create the, the lies inside this medical industrial complex. Right. And I know we're, we're like, we're running out of time. We already hit our time mark, but um, I really, the question I really wanted to ask you as a physician um, and what I have been in quandary about is that I feel like the physicians and the nurses for sure, they know in the back of their mind what they're doing is harmful. Do you, is that fair to say? Um, I would say, so I haven't been in contact with a lot of the physicians that have stayed in the last couple of years. I got a lot of um, people reaching out, you know, calling me crazy and, you know, a lot of that stuff. So I, I wasn't really going to necessarily stay in contact with them. I, I, Actually, truly in my heart, I believe that most of them think that they're doing the right thing. I think the ones that that maybe you're talking about are the ones that are have seen the harms and they've potentially connected the dots and they're still in the system and they're scared as shit because, and sorry, I don't know if that's going to, that, that's probably okay. No, that's fine. Yeah, we can say we can say we can say all those words, just not virus back in the back. I'll cut that out. I should stop saying that. But I I wonder though because there's been experiments where you um, have, people have taken subjects and played cards with them with a stacked deck. Yeah, but there's no way that the person can lose. Okay. Or win, rather. And so after, I think it was 15 deals, the person would start to figure out, like, hey, something's right. off. Right. The heart gave signs after the second deal. The heart knew it. Right. You started. They started sweating, or the heart rate would go up, or adrenaline would start to be produced. So in, I think in their heart, they know, like my patient, I always, I always ask, you know, when I work with clients or patients, I say, you know what the difference between me and a physician is, is my patients get better. Right. You would have to know year after year after year, like people are getting progressively worse to the point that now, you know, you give them the statin drugs and they're getting Alzheimer's and dementia. And I would think you would be able to put two and two together, or do you think they're just so indoctrinated into the system that it doesn't occur to them? They're just relying on the studies and the pieces of paper that tell them this drug is for that and this drug is for that. And so, you know, like, honestly, I, and this is just, I'm saying from the people that I've been around that I've been in contact with. I mean, yes, there are, you know, there's a lot of greed, right? There's a lot of people who will, I gave away a lot of my night call because I felt like crap, right? And I wanted to be home yeah. with my kids. I didn't want to be coming home and sleeping and feeling gross and yelling at them. And so people would scoop up my night call because you made like four times the amount of money doing a night call. And because in anesthesia, you're actually working most of the time. Right. So, I mean, there's, there was, and I would watch a lot of the surgeons work overtime and, and try to kind of take patients from other people. And because it would generate more money, like there's just, there was a money hungry drive in a lot of physicians. I wasn't, I just wasn't like that. 
Um, but I know that I'm not necessarily the norm when it comes to that as a physician. Um, you know, I, I know, again, this is what I've seen and I know myself, I was extremely busy, right? Like you're put through, when you go through medical school residency and you start your career, you're, you're sleep deprived. You don't even have enough time to sleep. And then people who've got families, you know, they get you, they also get you into debt because banks throw money at you. Right. So then you get into debt, you're buying cars, you're buying houses, you know, a summer house, a winter house, a whole bunch of toys. You got your kids and activities and it's kind of, you're trying to aspire to the level that other physicians are at and you're, you don't have the time to think. So even though it might cross your mind, cause I can tell you for me, and I don't, I mean, I, I'm very open about the fact that I totally feel that I was indoctrinated, you know, some of the things that I used to think or behave like, or things that I would say I cringe at now. Yeah. And there were, there's, there was part of me that, you know, would, would, there were glimmers of like, oh, maybe that's not right. Or why is it like that? But I just didn't, I didn't take the time. Okay. And until I had the time. I didn't take the time. And that's really why when I stopped working, I mean, I, when I, the other times I stopped was maternity leave and going through my divorce, like we went through trials and lots of court stuff. So there was stress there. It wasn't like I just had time to breathe. Um, so I just, I truly feel like these, most of them just aren't taking the time because like for myself, just to give an example, you know, I've worked in a hospital I've worked in a hospital most of my career, like through halfway through medical school, you're mostly in the hospitals. And then through my residency, I was almost always in the hospital. And then my career is mostly hospital or clinic. Now the food there is absolute crap, right? Everybody knows you cannot heal from the garbage that they serve. And then the vending machines that they have there and everyone's still allowed to smoke, even though there's most no smoking zones around the outside, the doors of the hospital, yeah. everyone's smoking, no one enforces it you know, patients are not going to heal, you know, they're not sleeping at night, and they need sleep to heal. Right. So that's like, you know, that but there's still a disconnect, like you're still thinking you're doing something good. And you know, maybe once they leave the hospital, they'll actually, <laughs> they'll actually get better. <laughs> but you know, I can tell you, um, I was talking to somebody recently who, you know, it was kind of a last resort, she was really, really, really trying to stay away from getting admitted to the hospital. But she still doesn't know why. Um, anyways, it doesn't matter why she, she ended up in the hospital for about 12 days. And she said it was so traumatic to be in there and what she was witnessing, like it was even worse than when I was there. And she said she was put on it. She's not geriatric. She was put on a geriatric ward. And she said 20% of the patients, first of all, were dying. So there was one guy that was screaming all night. She didn't get any sleep for eight nights. So she phoned someone, they moved her to another room with this old frail lady who was constantly coughing and aspirating on everything that was, she was coughing up. And so this happened at night and the woman was so frail, she couldn't ring the bell. So the person I was talking to beside her was ringing the bell for an hour. Nobody came for an hour. And she said, other than that, nobody did rounds at night. There was not one registered nurse. They were LPNs. She said they were all in their early twenties. She's like, I think they just went and slept in the back because the next morning when they were doing their rounds or the handover, you know, they were like, I don't know what happened last night, but you know, all the patients or beds are soiled. And, you know, she said she couldn't open the window. She couldn't get any fresh air. You know, there was no, there was no spot. I mean, this depends on the hospital, but there was no spot to go sit beside grass, you know, sit in a nice little kind of nature setting. And she said the food, I was lucky. My husband brought food in for me. That's it. They're, they're slaughterhouses. They're, I mean, they're death. It's a death cult. And I guess you're right. You're swimming in such dirty water. You think this is reality. You don't believe that you could possibly clean up the terrain around, you know, the fish. And you it's don't, yeah, how it is. And you don't, I don't know if it's, and you don't, you don't think you have the capability either. Cause just another example, if you have time, I don't want to. Yeah. Um, someone else, one of the other nurses that I know who she reached out to me about a year after I left and I had no idea that she had, she got one shot and then she got, was injured. She had cardiac problems and neurological injury and 
fatigue and um, she was having to go back to have some kind of test from another specialist and she was afraid of talking to this person because she was afraid they were going to judge her and criticize her for not working because and not getting the second shot and I was like you were harmed what what do you mean why would you go get something you know and another, another shot anyways she went and was talking to this specialist saying oh you know I'm not working I'm on disability because of blah 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 and you know this is what happened after I got the first jab and he said oh yeah you know, that happened, that same thing happened to both me and my wife. And she kind of looked at him and she said, but, but you're working. So, and you needed both of them. And he's like, well, yeah, we just had to get it. Cause otherwise, you know, what was I supposed to do? I, I can't not work. That's it right there. That's the level of disconnect that I've seen. You're right. Um, and it's, it's just that to the point where you can't even call it cognitive dissonance. It's just brainwashing. Or, you know, I had someone, I do hospice also in, in home hospice, and I had somebody say, um, thank God they got the jabs. Can you imagine how much worse it would be than no. death? I like, know. I, I mean, and this is actual statements. Yeah. And and I really, truly think like the, the television programming, like it's television programming, these people are becoming channels they're channeling that information to each other reinforcing it over and over and over because that i mean i don't have a tv but yet i was up to date on every single news story just from going hiking and hearing people talk through their masks yeah. <laughs> because that was the only time i've ever seen people on the trails with me right was <laughs> that time with the lockdown it was like everyone came out of their house and but yet that they weren't experiencing it because they had the masks on and the goggles and hazmat suits. But um, I will, I think I'm going to have to have you back on because I, there's still two more pages of notes that I really just wanted to dive into. Uh, okay. But I now that we've got your story, we've got your background, you know, I really want to, there's so many more questions I have for you about truly how the body heals. You know, I, my philosophy has always been stop the root causes of the toxins and the poisons and let the body do what it does best, heal itself. Like it just will heal itself. Yeah. And a lot of times what I have seen and observed is like before I would say, oh, take some for well, UTIs. I do the baking soda and oil of oregano. But before that, it would just be like, well, maybe do some mulein leaves in water and do a steam. For your to get your but a lot of times people will say to me on my telegram group they're like well i i got lazy or i didn't have any mulein leaves and i got better in four days had they done the mulein leaves we would have said oh that's what healed right. you right right or right the, people will call in for their you know their dogs or their cats and they're like well i didn't have the oregano to put under the armpits but they got better in three days right and so we it's usually what the person is not doing or stop doing like the pet usually fasts they'll throw up and have diarrhea and they won't eat right. or drink for right. four or five days and then boom right. they get better so i really now more and more and then now i'm writing a book with robin openshaw about the supplement and vitamin industry and the more research i do it's not just you know i thought it was vitamin d and maybe the vitamin c and zinc we're toxic and then i now i see is like oh no it's all of it it's yeah. all of it and yeah. it wouldn't it be and you know just talking to you right now the last thing i'm going to say is um those vials that they've given people from the beginning you know when it started with polio and um yeah. they knew the game yeah so why would you just let your slave population go and be healthy because they know cradle to grave what we're worth if we're sick and in the system and renal failure and right. you know congestive heart failure and all the diseases that break it in until you get dementia and then you go on a memory ward with me and you will wake up immediately because that is a horrific way to spend the last decade of your life or five years of your life not knowing who you are yeah. they're just they're these hungry ghosts yeah well, it's it's interesting because a lot of people 
have asked me, I don't, I don't like to say that I give advice. I just say that what, this is what I would do. But honestly, people that I know who are very, very, very much aware of the agenda and everything going on, they still go to get their mammograms and they still go to get a colonoscopy and they still, and I'm like, no, like I just won't, I won't do any of that. Why would I go? Don't give them your blood. Don't give them your fluids. Don't give them your allow them to radiate you they're looking for something wrong and they're looking to cast spells and you have been like we've all been programmed yes so they get in your head then you think to yourself even if you are awake and even for me it's like well what if the what ifs creep in and then all of a sudden it'll take your fear away for a minute yeah okay this is what my doctor said to do i'm gonna follow that protocol and then the real you is like, no, 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 this is making it worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So Rachel, this has been amazing. I really definitely want to have a part two. Where can people find you if they want to work with you and and learn more? So I have a website, which is easy. It's just my name, rachelmaurismd.com. And I'm on Facebook, which is just my name, Rachel Maurice. And Instagram, it's Rachel underscore Maurice underscore MD. Um, And I also have a, I just kind of, I created a little while ago, a free guide to help women overcome fatigue who are perimenopausal, regain their youthful vitality, because that's a story um, that I have uh, as well. And I'm just kind of getting to the point of finishing this online program again on overcoming fatigue. That's sort of a more, a deeper dive than just a, um, a free guide. But I just wanted to say one, one last quick thing that um, where I'm at right now from even where, when I left this, the, the hospital, I was in a state of resistance fighting and, you know, that same level of, of consciousness really as that they want to keep us in and, I am now like I still see a lot of people there. I think there's there's um, there's a place for everybody, and everyone's got their own mission here. But I feel like I'm I've gone to a place where I I'm not interested in giving, like you said, giving that that realm right power. Right. I think the more we clean up ourselves. Like we, like you said, we have such power. So even just cleaning ourselves up has such immense effects on the people around us, people, people across the earth. But I think helping people to clean themselves up as well, which is what I'm, where my focus is, will allow their brain to come, at least give them the best chance to have their brain come back online. And then, you know, we've got much more of a movement here. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And it's not just their brain. It's like their, their soul and their heart and their spirit comes back online and the level of intuition, like my intuition now is just on fire. Yeah. And, and the, my BS meter is yeah. perfectly honed. You know, you just, you're not, I'm not going to fall for anything anymore. And so I took a long circuitous route as I'm sure, I mean, now with your story, you did as well, but sharing your story, sharing my story. It's like now people can beeline more towards that awakening and not make all the the mistakes I did and fall into that rabbit hole and spin on that hamster wheel for a while and hop up to another one. It's like, you can just get there straight to cleaning your, your environment. Like my live pure is 10 weeks and I needed 20 weeks to tell you all the different ways you're being tricked into poisoning yourself, like scented candles and laundry soap and dishwasher detergent that causes leaky gut and dementia. And it's like, ah, (laughs) but it's so simple when you, when it's like to first learn all of that can be overwhelming, but then you're back into your intuition and you're going to know, oh, I'm not going to buy toxic chemicals and put them in my house expecting to stay healthy. Aha. Yeah. Now we got it. <laughs> Thank you so much for lighting up this hour with me, Rachel Maurice. And all of the links to find her will be down below. And stay tuned for our part two. Thank you. Thanks for having me.